Terra incognita spectator. Terra incognita spectator. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' websites and publications. This is our second Christmas edition of TISF, and to mark the occasion we have a jam-packed Christmas stocking just for you. The book review segment is on hiatus until next year, but instead we have not one but three stories to keep you amused during the holiday break. Trent Jameson's story, Always, is a typically romantic and quirky tale from Trent about lost love refound. They First Make Mad is one of my own stories originally published in Agog Fantastic Fiction and featuring multiple time travel and the unseen problems that can bring. And our final story is Come to Daddy, written and read by Brendan Duffy. It's a cautionary Christmas tale of twisted family relations. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the first of our stories, Always, by Trent Jameson. My work, my driving work, was done. We had pierced the shivering membrane of the universe, and the last way station was already so distant that it defied imagination. Standard procedure. I can drive here, as my licence will attest. I've earned the right and the bitter nugget of pride that comes with it. Regardless, it's something that's better off left to the AI. Safer. But it's not just a driving job. It's a people one too. These passengers were my wards. You've got to love them. Love them honestly, Govinda once told me, long ago. Every single one of them needs you more than they can ever know. I was taking them off-world, between worlds, across a lot of space and a lot of time. You take the highway and there's no going back. For driver and passenger both. After Deb died, I took up this job, started running and haven't stopped. When you lose your everything, driving doesn't look like such a bad deal. We're all wounded here, Govinda said when she started my training. You've just got to accept it, got to work with it. Govinda was one of the best. She taught me at the end of her career. But then careers do not end here. They ripple. You do not leave the highway, not really. There's always echoes. I've come across her several times since, at way station bars and the like. But they all predate me. None of them know of the single night we shared late in my training, an evening that stripped away a little of the pain, or maybe made it something else. Because after that night I'd fled her too, drove away into a different place and time. The only thing worse was the one time I saw myself, an earlier me, driving my first bus, a big and basic model. It hurt, catching a glimpse of my past. Certain brutal truths were driven home. I was sadder, angrier, still struggling with the responsibilities that I hadn't even considered would come with the job. Well, that's how I remember it. But damned if I could see that in my eyes, because the truth is, I don't remember what I was thinking back then. Hell, even if I did, it would be an illusion, distorted by the years that separated us, by the things that I've learnt and seen, by the endless, mutable miles of the highway. I saw the blank, incomprehensible face that was my own and realised that time had severed me from my past. Now, everything is now, perpetually changing, merely coated with a crust of apparent stability, the me on the tip of the wave. I hid before I could see myself. It's a little wonder that few search themselves out at the way stations or look too closely at rigs that could be their own. No one likes to see their own face and the stranger behind it. I got up from the driver's seat and after a cursory glance at the monitors, everything running smoothly, I looked over my passengers. This is transportation of the lost. There are other faster ways and some of them eschew corporality altogether, but none are cheaper than the buses. However, these travellers must pay in other ways. The highways distort time. They are unshielded from relativity or, as some arguments go, extremely susceptible to it. 
You can end up at a depot a thousand years before you began, or a hundred thousand years after. Something to do with temporal spatial flex. I've never understood the physics, and if anyone asks, I can rattle out the TSF ratios and the standard company spiel, but that's where my knowledge ends. I just drive the bus and help my passengers make it through. What it all boils down to is this. You pay your money and you take your chances. If there is any continuity in the universe, I've yet to find evidence of it, beyond pain and the highways, beyond the road that stretches on forever and the past that drives you along it. There were about 40 passengers on the bus, 30 of these tuned out, plugged into whatever personal systems they could afford. The usual stuff, VR simulators, powder fabulators, even a couple of straight-up personal sound systems of the sort you slip into your ears rather than your cortex. I walked the length of the bus, and those who hadn't zoned out clung to me with their eyes. I chatted and calmed and dipped into the all-too-large collection of lame jokes that I knew and did my best to take their minds off what was happening. Every single one of them would have fretted enough. You do not make this decision lightly. They deserved a break from their doubts. Among them was a girl in a bright floral dress. She didn't have any personal entertainment systems, not even a simple stereo unit. Sarah Edwards. You know all their names, that's part of the job. I'd packed her things in a side compartment. Her luggage was small, almost pathetically light, though the nervous smile that she gave me was weighted with so much hope. Do you think it'll be a long journey? I shook my head. There's no way of knowing, Sarah, the times chop and change. Often it takes 30 hours. Others were there in under 10. She gripped my arm, gently but firmly, and I noticed the bruises, poorly hidden by makeup, running from her wrists to her shoulder. Sarah's chin, too, bore the faintest memory of a bruise. I hope it doesn't take too long. Her gaze flicked to the window. It's weird out there. I'd read about the highways, of course, everything I could find, but I didn't expect it to be so unsettling. I smiled my most professional and calming smile. It can be beautiful. The things I've seen, some of them can take your breath away. But the dust that beat against the glass then was nothing special, just the usual spiral of light. The active charge of the bus wasn't disturbing the particles all that much, which meant the TS flux cycle was in a crescent phase. Still, I knew what she meant. I'd felt the same way. It's the physics of it all, the mind-bending paradox of the highway. It spans the universe that should not be. The greatest alien artefact, if it is indeed an artefact at all, or for that matter alien. And we drive buses along it. That's the human species for you. Give us all the wonders in the universe and we'll find a way to make them mundane. How long have you been doing this? She asked. I looked down at her, my face twisted. I could feel it, an involuntary reaction that I'd never quite been able to outrun. A long time, a long, long time. Leaving Sarah to her thoughts, I walked to the toilets. Gareth had gleefully informed me of the mess waiting down there. Someone had thrown up, missing the bowl and spraying all over the floor. The acrid smell of vomit was not at all an unfamiliar one on these journeys. It clung to the back of my throat cleaning module on my bus was running to one-third efficiency. I hoped to get it fixed at the next way station. That didn't help me now. Sighing, I reached for the old-fashioned mop and bucket and got to work. There's something up ahead, Gareth subbed, just as I finished. What exactly? There was a moment of almost exasperated silence. If I knew, I would tell you. I don't trade in ambiguities. It's some kind of distortion on the road. I could run over it, but I think we should stop. I walked up front... Buses are almost indestructible, self-repairing and very cautious. There is a little room for air out here. OK, let's do it. Gareth stopped the bus about a 100 metres from the anomaly. The dust died down. He launched one of his drones to take a look. It's a face, Gareth said, then brought the image up onto the cockpit monitor. I went cold. I'm going out there. Are you sure that's wise? Deb, I whispered. That's Deb's face. I slipped on the armour and felt it mould around my body. I avoided the mirror instinctively. I knew I cut a fairly ridiculous figure. A tin man with a round belly. Too much driving and not enough exercise or vanity to pay for fat-eating viruses. I used to be vain. Not any more. Deb would have laughed at me, and the thought of her, not to mention the thought of what lay out there, sent a chill down my spine. The passengers were all staring at me now, and I lifted the faceplate and smiled. I'm sorry about this. There's something on the road and I'm going to have to have a look at it before we can go on. It's standard procedure. 
hope my face wasn't too pale. My hands were numb in the cool containment of the armour. It certainly didn't feel like standard procedure. What if something happens to you out there? Sarah asked. If something happens to me, Gareth will take over, but nothing will happen. The external atmosphere is within standard parameters. There has never been any trouble on the highway, and there's absolutely no reason to expect it now. Of course, none of that was absolutely true. You drive long enough and you hear stories. Things on the road, buses coming in empty, their AI's memory wiped clean. Never from someone who's actually experienced them, of course. Never often enough to give credence to the tales, just enough to plant a seed of doubt. Something was out there, and the armour, more a shield against the radiation that the TSF occasionally generated, felt completely inadequate. I stepped through the door, and it shut behind me with a click. I walked towards the anomaly, my breathing loud in my ears. Your heart rate is up a little, Gareth said. What do you expect? There, I've fixed it. I thought about Deb. Her death was swift, a freak accident. There'd been a sudden depressurization of the sky tube she and her children were taking, the result of a flaw in the spun diamond walls of the tube and a micrometeor impact. Seventy-one people died in seconds, the oxygen in their blood boiling away. Deb had always said that she would try and contact me if she died first, and in a way she had. Somehow she'd managed a simple text message. I found it in my log a day after the accident. One word. Always. That word was in my head as I walked along the highway, towards a replica of her face. Always. At last I reached the spot and looked down. I felt as though someone had punched me. I forgot to breathe. Deb. She was as beautiful as I remembered. That's it with faces. You think you forget that they've faded from all hope of true recollection, and then it burns back perfect. And with that single image comes a flood of emotions, of memories, little things you didn't realise that you'd ever noticed. The small scar under her right ear, the right curl of her lips. I gazed upon her features and tears splashed against my faceplate. It was surreal, almost Dali-esque. Where the road ended was Deb's skin, pale and freckled as I remembered her skin to be. Is that really flesh? I asked. No, Gareth replied. It is remarkably lifelike, but it's definitely not flesh. I crouched down to touch it, and the face opened its eyes. Deb's bright green eyes stared at me, and I stumbled back. Richard, she said, and then the face was gone, swallowed up by the road. I fell to my knees and scrambled to the spot where it had been. Gone. I clawed my glove fingers over the road and wept. Deb gave me a piece of rose quartz on our second date, and it is all I keep of her, that and her final message. Sometimes, when I'm at my darkest, I open up her text. Always. I sat in the cockpit and watched the universe smudge against the glass. The quartz felt soft in my hand. I squeezed it until my fingers ached. What was out there? Sarah asked, surprising me, so that I almost dropped the stone. Just the ghost of a memory, I said. She smiled. Sometimes I wish I could remove all my memories, just wipe the slate clean. They fade eventually, every memory fades. Do they? She said. I think memories are always, I think we spend our lives circling around them, trying to give them meaning. I stared out at the road. The dust was growing more excitable. Charged particles dancing like ghosts around the bus. I loved her and now she's gone. Sarah squeezed my shoulder. I loved him and he beat me up, beat me and yet I loved him so much. And even now I feel I betrayed him. At least your memories are good. She left me then and walked back to her seat. There's another anomaly coming up, Gareth said. I took a deep breath. Stop when you're close. I'm going out again. The hand was curled into a fist, rising out of the road. I reached down and it grabbed me. The grip was strong enough that I could feel it through the armour. Reflexively, I pulled back. Engines in the suit whined. Monitors went red. But I did not give up, and the hand rose. It came with an arm, then a head and shoulders. I fell to the ground, Gareth yelling in my skull. Deb looked down at me and blinked. She was still holding my hand. Slowly, she pulled me to my feet. Richard, she said. It's coming. I shook my head. What's coming? You'll know when it arrives. I know I shouldn't, but I... Something caught her attention, behind me. Her eyes widened and then she was gone, collapsed back into the road. I turned, but there was nothing there, nothing at all. 
If it is all reassuring, I cannot detect any other anomalies. Thanks, Gareth, I said. But I don't know what we're dealing with. Deb, she, whatever she was, spoke to me. I know, Gareth said. It may have looked like Deb, but it wasn't human. What was it, then, I asked? The road. It was the same substance as the road. Which meant that Gareth didn't have a clue. No one did. We were travelling down the highway at around 700 kilometres an hour, twice the usual speed. Both Gareth and I agreed that if we could avoid running into whatever was coming, all the better. Outside, the dust in the void had become increasingly agitated. Mad patterns spiralled against the glass. I looked back at my passengers. They seemed more than a little agitated too. Someone was throwing up in the toilets. I hoped they had better aim than the last person. I'd have to speak to them all soon. A beeper went off in the cockpit and I smiled. The nearest exit had locked onto us. We'd be off the highway in under two hours. A storm was coming, but with any luck it would miss us entirely. Um, Richard, we appear to be having a problem. Something is slowing the bus down. Everything is working properly, and yet there's a measurable reduction in speed. Gareth sounded worried. Richard, I don't know if I can trust my senses any more. I nodded, understanding his fears. AIs are all senses and readings. If they lose the ability to understand them, they lose the ability to function. I think you should take over here, Gareth said. I need to concentrate on making some sense of all this. OK, I'll switch to manual. The bus was suddenly under my control, the sheer power of it rumbling into my hands through the steering wheel. We were definitely still moving, though according to Gareth we were not. I pushed the speed up to 900. Richard, we're going backwards. What? I pulled the bus to a halt. Then I felt it, a slight shuddering in the wheel, a sense of something building. It's coming, I whispered and got to my feet. I opened the door and looked out. Nothing, no movement. How fast are we going? Fast, very fast, and it's increasing exponentially. We'll reach light speed in around two minutes. I began to wonder why we weren't dead. The acceleration should have crushed us. The armour I wore suddenly felt very insignificant. I looked at my passengers and they looked at me. Everybody was most definitely switched on. Something is happening, I said, but I'm going to do whatever I can to get you through this. It's coming, Sarah said gripping the hem of her dress tightly in her hands and releasing. It's here! Something slammed into us. The bus creaked, and Gareth shrieked with it, then shut down. I was thrown to the floor. A couple of passengers hit their heads, and then there was silence. Only for a moment, we looked at each other. Voices. There were hundreds of voices. Thousands, millions, billions upon billions. And I realised suddenly they had always been there a kind of background radiation of chatter, always there but never really noticed. Maybe I hadn't known how to listen. Gareth, I sub, what's happening? There was no response, no static, no sense of Gareth's presence at all. It chilled me to the bone, nothing to give me data updates or slow a racing heart. I walked up and down the aisle, but for a few bruised heads, everybody seemed okay. I want you all to stay inside, I said, then walked to the door, opened it, and my jaw dropped. The road was gone, replaced by faces, a concretation of expressions stretching away into the distance. I jumped from the bus, and they parted before me, creating a path leading away, leading towards Deb. My head spun. What was going on? Cautiously I walked towards her, and when at last we stood face to face, she hugged me tightly. Richard, you've been running a long time, a very long time. I can't believe that it took so long to catch up. Not that long, surely, I said. Years, maybe, but not that long. She brought a finger to my lips. Longer than you think, Richard. Longer than you suspect. She squeezed my hand. There's someone I think you might want to see. Govinda smiled at me as we approached. Richard, get out of that armour. You don't need it here. I nodded, and as I stripped out of the intelligent metal, I looked along the road at the highway of faces, every eye trained on me. What's happening, I asked. What the hell's going on? I've got passengers back there. Those passengers are your wards, Richard, and you've always looked after them well. But who looks after you? I don't need looking after. Govinda laughed and Deb with her. These two women who had loved and lost. That may be right, Govinda said, but you've been hurting for a long time. You've been driving for such a long time. No longer than anyone else, I said, knowing it was a lie. And I've never needed help. I get my passengers to their destination, I make sure they're all right, 
and then I take the next load on. When was the last time you got off the highway? I realised I couldn't answer that. The truth is you never stop when you're driving. There's always more people to take a little further up the road. God, I couldn't remember when I'd last stopped for more than a day at a way station. Is that all you've stopped me for to tell me that I need to relax? Govinda laughed. You were always thick-headed, Richard. Kind heart, thick head. You've been calling us. A hundred years, a thousand. Why, you've been calling us since the beginning of time. What do you think this road is? How do you think it works? The highway is as ancient as that first eternal instant when the galaxy, the clumping, pulsing fire of it all, were put into place. When heat was beyond heat, when the universe itself paused before its first great inflationary burst. And you've been calling us since then. Took a long while to catch up. But then, you never stopped, Rich. I looked at Deb, my Deb. Always, she whispered, the universe is always. And I hung my head and wept. I've missed you, Richard. You never let me go, but you have to. The more you run, the more it just builds up behind you. I felt her fingers on my face. You died, I said, and I couldn't do a thing. What was I supposed to do? You died and I couldn't change it. Couldn't fix it. Deb brushed my face with her fingers. The only thing you could fix was yourself, Richard. Get on with your life. Now let me go. I lifted my gaze to hers and knew that I would never see it again, not so perfectly. She smiled. Heal yourself, Richard. I miss you. Deb smiled. I wouldn't expect it any other way. Then she was gone. I turned to Govinda. What do you want? I asked. She shook her head sadly. Honey, this isn't about what I want. It's about what you need. You don't stop running until you're ready. She looked at me. The highway looked at me with its multitude of eyes. Are you ready? My passengers. And then I felt a familiar presence in my skull. Richard, Gareth said, back online. There's some serious flux work here and I think it's going to get even more interesting. Gareth paused, reading something in my expression or remembering, then said softly, I can take them on. Got to talk to them first, I said. Slowly I walked back to the bus. They were frightened. I could see it in their eyes, but I was frightened too. I'd felt the storm behind me for longer than I knew, perhaps ever since I got on the road. So I smiled, and it relaxed them a little. I told them what Govinda had told me, told them how I'd been running for so long. I apologised, and they forgave me. Sometimes you just got to leave, I said. Sometimes that's all you can do. I'll look after them, Gareth said. It's what I was made for. Maybe I'll see you sometime. Yeah, I said. Sara gripped my hand, face resolute. I'm coming with you too. I looked into her eyes and knew that she meant it. Okay, I said, not knowing what else to say, just that it felt right. I walked towards the baggage compartment to get her things and she stopped me. I don't think we'll need that where we're going. Gareth, I said, there's one more thing I'd like you to do. What's that? Clear my inbox. I don't need it any more. I don't need her message. I picked up the quartz and put it down. I didn't need that any more either. I could not forget her. She was as much a part of me as life itself. She had followed me down every road, down infinities beyond knowing. Sarah, are you ready? Yes, I think I am. We stepped out of the bus and watched it drive away, and I felt not fear but relief. Govinda was waiting, and behind her, not far away at all, the road was shifting, changing, a door taking shape, our own private exit. Where are we going? I asked. Govinda smiled, reaching for the door. This is the highway. Who can tell where or when? You pay your money and you take your chances. Why don't you walk through and find out? I looked at Sara and she held my gaze. Then hand in hand, that's what we did. And now, The First Night Mad, written and read by Keith Stevenson. My stomach clenches, anticipating the next breach, but still I'm unprepared. Picture a stone skipping across a glassy lake, but in reverse. The ripples move in towards the epicentre of every impact, each one bringing a jolt of ecstatic pain that unravels the senses, contorts muscles into cramping. And then the pain is gone and you're airborne, flying relentlessly towards the next touchdown, your body remaking itself in agonising surges, telomeres lengthen, years fall away, all in a smothering silence. 
even though you know you've been screaming since the journey began. Timing isn't everything with this kind of travel. It's the only thing. The lozenge deposits me in a newly vacated service elevator and skips on towards its inevitable rendezvous with plank time. The pain is gone with the transition. That was another me, another life. I look at myself in the smoky glass of the wall panel. Fingers feel smooth, taut skin where an hour ago, subjective, there had been dry wrinkles. I have an erection. I smile at myself in the mirrored surface and exit. All around me is bustle and life. This is Paris, 2096, before the pogroms. The left bank is still intact, and I stroll along, breathing the summer air, looking at the pastels and charcoals. My hand closes in my wallet. The codes it contains set up 80 years ago subjective. A couple of days past real time, promise a very comfortable lifestyle, but there's no rush to access them. The old man I used to be was cautious to a fault and made sure the wallet contained banknotes appropriate to the era in case I was stranded by the dilation. I can think of better uses to put them to now. He chose Paris because of its conservatism, its relative political stability, but Paris has another side to appeal to a younger man's appetites. I turn towards the Boulevard Saint-Germain and the CCM Arrondissement. Not for the first time it occurs to me what a selfish life I lead. I console myself with the fact that publicising my discovery would have consigned it to destruction at best and some darkly motivated government meddling at worst. Given the alternatives, I decided to put it to the finest use I could possibly imagine, providing me with a long and comfortable life. Some would consider this a petty and pointlessly self-centred use of such an invention, they are the dreamers and visionaries, and I'm sure they truly believe they can make the world a better place. Embarking on my third lifetime, I feel my way is far more grounded in reality. I smile at the girl sleeping beside me. I smell the soft ringlets of her hair mingled with the scent of fresh sweat and sex. She's not beautiful, but the first bloom of youth gives her a certain attractiveness, a sought-after vitality which is ephemeral at best. Standing in the cold parquetry, I stride to the window. The boulevard surges with traffic like a mighty river. Flyers hover above the main floor, waiting to swoop into newly vacated gaps in a seemingly chaotic but radar-controlled valley of near misses. The slidewalks are likewise crowded with business people, cafe goers, tourists, students, all of them approaching the ephemeral, while I feel myself becoming progressively more solid, more heavily engraved on the times with each passage. More real even than reality. Perhaps this is what it feels like to be a god. <clears throat> Et un message pour vous, monsieur, the concierge says as I hand over a few crumpled bills. I look at the preferred mag strip as if it were a striking viper. There's only one person who could know who I am and where I might be found this close to emergence. We aren't meant to communicate. Reluctantly, I snatch it from his nicotine fingers and push through the belly pock revolving doors to the street beyond. My reader's the latest model for 2096. The case, of course, is battered and scarred, but it works well enough. I swipe the strip over the port and the screen lights up. Place Georges Pompidou, 16 July 2096, 11.15 a.m. I check my chrono. I plan to cross the river to the central branch of the Banque de France anyway. This represents only a minor detour. But is it safe? The trouble with an infinitely extended lifespan is that it multiplies natural caution at least tenfold. Your life somehow becomes much more precious simply because there's more of it. I began to grow irritated by a predilection I developed for doing nothing. It was the mark of an old man, and I'm certainly not that now. Besides, inaction could be equally deadly. A communication of this type would not be sent without some very good reason. I know myself that well, at least. I eschew the metro, preferring to push along through the throngs of people. The meeting place isn't far from my young legs. I feel so alive again. The Seine flows darkly beneath me as I cross Pont Saint-Michel. Ile de la Cité is far quieter and I pass the conciergerie quickly. I'm just passing Pont au Change when a man in front of me keels over suddenly and I fall on top of him. Monsieur, I begin, pushing myself to half crouch. Then I see his eyes, completely milk white. I touch his face. The skin has lost its elasticity and feels hot. I crouch low over him, head craning to catch sight of the assailant as panic takes hold. Qu'est-ce que c'est? 
a voice says from behind, and then I'm sent sprawling as another body falls across me. I get my knees under me, heave the weight off, and sprint for the far side of the bridge. There are shouts behind me and a gendarme shrill whistle, but I don't dare stop running. Two people microwaved, one of them right on top of me. It has to be more than coincidence. I'm well past Place du Châtelet before I force myself to a stroll, but my heart is pounding as much in fear as through my recent exertion. The Pompidou Centre isn't far now, but will I be walking into a trap? The rational part of my mind tells me it's probably safe. If whoever was shooting had sent the message, he would have waited at the meeting place, not knowing what route I may take. Perhaps I simply stumbled into some lunatic's hour of carnage. No sane person would fire a weapon so close to the prefecture of police. Cautious self-preservation wins out as I make my way to the wide open space that sides onto the Pompidou Centre. Crowds are out already, enjoying the warm summer sun. I keep to the west side of the square, in the lee of a group of older buildings that seem to glare accusingly at the retrofitted oblong of glass and multicoloured ducting opposite. I scan the rooftops, looking for likely positions for sniper fire. But I'm fooling myself. I no more know where a professional killer might secrete himself than he can play violin. Still, circumspection is the best tactic. I skirt the square, looking at faces in the crowd. Most of the people there are staring up at the huge hologram that hovers above them, the solar system in miniature moving in stately fashion as digits on the hollow sun's face count down the seconds to the next century. I throw my last few coins at a street vendor and receive a cheese and ham crepe. Mostly empty calories, I'm afraid, a voice says behind me. I spin around. A man, my height and colouring, but with a full beard and moustache, is standing there. I look into my own eyes. We're not, I begin. I know that, but this is a matter of life and death. Ours. I look around. The street vendor is watching us, an odd expression on his face as his eyes jog between my friend and myself. Walk with me, I say. And he falls in step as we begin to pace the outside of the square. You're not going to give me prior knowledge, I ask. I have an odd feeling in the pit of my stomach. Some things were never meant to happen, and this is one of them. Only what you need to survive. But I'm more in danger than you. I'm the second. It's you who has the advantage. I stop and look at him. I don't remember any of this. He smiles in that annoying way I have. It appears knowledge is limited by the speed of time, regardless of how often you go around. Then he becomes serious. I came in from NASA in the orbital flyer this morning. Someone's going to kill our sixth in two days' time. I stop again. So life is finite after all. Wait a minute. How do you know, I ask? Number four saw the aftermath. It was on a news vid. A madman with a gun in central Melbourne. Number six was caught in the crossfire. Four sought out one and told him. Of course, number one couldn't do anything until the lozenge carried him back past the event and he became me. But the fact he knew about Six's death was enough to kick him into a new timeline during the backward trip. And thanks to the lozenge, the rest of us came along for the ride. It's a whole new ball game now. I figured I could use some help. Too many madmen, I see. What? My earlier self looks at me as if I have gone mad. Someone was taking pot shots at people with a microwave gun on my way here, I explain. I very nearly didn't make it. Suppose this madman in Melbourne wasn't just firing indiscriminately. He grabs my arm and steers me towards the metro entrance. Where are we going, I ask? To the bank and then the orbiter port. Travelling with oneself, seeing ourselves as others see us, is an unnerving experience. I quickly become annoyed at the predictability of my partner's foibles, insisting on a window seat, boarding at the last possible moment, issuing the package meals in favour of some food supplement purchased in the port lobby. Our my decision to live out each life in separate parts of the globe takes on a new significance. It isn't just to avoid prior knowledge and the awful feeling of predestination. If we are to share the same space for any amount of time, we'll probably end up killing each other ourselves. I try to distract myself from cataloguing faults by focusing on the reason for our flight. If the shootings are linked and I've been discovered, my active imagination lays out a whole galaxy of perpetrators, but none seem more likely than any other. Has the government found my device in the future and dispatched assassins to wipe me from the time stream? Or is it someone I offended in one of my incarnations, someone who's been able to discover my true nature and set about taking revenge in the most methodical overkill way possible? 
there's still the possibility of coincidence. Live often enough and you're bound to run into life-threatening situations more than once. One hour after lifting, we step off our flight in Melbourne. The cheery sun of Paris is all but forgotten in the overcast chill of midnight in midwinter. I have no idea where he'd be staying, I say, as we wait for the rapid link into town. We know where he'll be in two days' time. At the opening of the Pacific Games, I even have the seat block pinned down in the stadium. The link speeds us into the heart of the city. Melbourne is a predictable clutter of thrusting towers in a collection of washed-out rainbow hues. It lacks the character of the European cities and is positively third world compared to the beanpole spikes of the equatorial states. A glass steel canopy spreads across the CBD, sheltering us from the worst of the winter. We choose adjoining suites at one of the city's best hotels. They're all the same, really. There's no way I'm going to share a room, but we need to stay close, so this is a compromise. I lock the communicating door in my side and run a hot bath, sinking into a mountain of bubbles. I should be relaxing in a suite at the Georges Sank, ruminating over a bottle of Veuve Clicquot by now. I had the next 80 years all mapped out, and now I can't see past the next 48 hours. I rub at my temples, trying to massage away a tension headache. Damn this killer anyway! What right has he to endanger my lives? He's a mayfly by comparison and nothing. I think of what I'll do to him when we finally track him down. I won't be using anything as quick as a microwave gun. My dreams crowd with phantom assailants and I wake next morning feeling no better. My partner, I called myself Abel Cartwright in that incarnation, wants to go out to the games site and do some snooping, but I beg off, suggesting it's best we keep exposure to each other to a minimum. I do some vague global net searching on the room port, but I soon give up. My entire being is refocusing around 11.23am, Wednesday 18th July 2096. If I save our sixth, my life can return to the track I've chosen for it. If I fail, I have to wait to become our fourth and try again. But between those two points will be 80 years of recriminations, if onlys, about what happened and what ifs about my next chance. I don't want to live my life that way. So I wait in my room, drink too much and hate. Hate the killer. Hate the maids who interrupt me and leave again hastily, beds unmade, towels unchanged. Hate the city below me. I shower and dress early the next morning. I'm ready for Abel before he knocks and we leave quietly together, walking the few hundred metres down to the bay and Victoria Stadium where the opening ceremony will be held. Security's slack, after all, these are the friendly games and we pass quickly through to the main arena. Abel has fake IDs for us as technicians with the Global Net Data Streaming Division. Trackside, the air is thick with hoverbots and the crowd is already making a hell of a noise. I hate sport. Christ alone knows what I am doing at the stadium. The police reports peg the shots coming from the gantry, Abel says, indicating an access way above the second bank of seating across the field. Let's go, I say, anxious to get it over with. A giant hollow orb is floating above the centre of the field. Some ageing chanteuse is belting out the Pacific anthem, her bloated features magnified a hundredfold. I will be back in Paris in six hours, I promise myself. There is no way I'm spending another night here. Metal stairs run up through a gap in the stand. I take them two at a time. Wait up, Abel calls behind me. You'll scare him off. He'll be scared all right, but he won't be going anywhere. I reach the door to the access way and throw it open. It slams against the support beam and the whole ganchi rings with the impact. Someone's crouched overlooking the field halfway along. A heavy-duty assault rifle pressed to his cheek. He looks up, startled. For the second time in as many days, I stare myself in the face. I recover first, covering the distance between us before he can swing the rifle my way. I kick him hard in the side of the head and he goes down, the rifle skittering away across the check plate. I'm consumed by rage. I want to hurt something badly. I reach down and grab a handful of shirt front. He has to be the fifth or maybe higher. You idiot, I say, slapping him hard. You're ruining everything, damn it. Slap. What do you think you're playing at? Slap. A goblet of blood sprays from his ruined lips and I drop him to the decking. The crowd's screaming outside. It's hot as hell and this piece of shit, my own self for Christ's sake, is the reason I've been dragged here. He stares up at me, eyes all focused, and laughs. Laughs! The sounds of the crowd fades, drowned out by a rushing noise that fills my ears. My cheeks are burning and I grab him by the ears and smash his head into the decking. Laugh that off! 
I slam him again and again, arms wrap around my chest, dragging me away. I kick at the blood-spattered face until I'm pulled out of range. Stop it! It's Abel. Get a hold of yourself, for God's sake. We're meant to be saving a life. He deserves it, I snarl. A massive explosion lifts us up together and flings us against the gantry wall. There's an eerie silence, and then the screaming below starts up again, this time laden with terror. The banner covering the front of the gantry has been blown away. Across the field there's a smoking hole in the seating, where our six have been. Floods of people are running now, fleeing the blast zone. Abel pulls a slim screen from his pocket. Bomb. Most likely a terrorist attack, the announcer's saying. Wait, we have an image of the terrorist, believed to be still at large in the stadium. A grainy still taken by hoverbot, judging from the angle, appears. The image is being cleaned as we watch, a man bending down, touching a translucent sphere with one small grey rod protruding from its pearly white surface. The face is looking right at the lens. Number six, I say in a hoarse whisper. Abel sinks back in his haunches. What is happening to us, he says, his face pale. I'm not a violent man. I'm not a bomber or a sniper. I've never even been in a fist fight, but look what you did. All of you. I sit beside him, sparing a glance for my own handiwork, slumped on the floor. The rage has left me as quickly as it came. Abel's right. Ordinarily I wouldn't hurt a fly, and as for the rifle, I've never picked one up, let alone fired one. Something's changing, as I see. There's a scrape behind me, and when I look around, our fifth is standing, swaying slightly, the rifle pointed at my eye socket. I should feel fear, but something hardens inside me. I grab the muzzle, push, twist, and ram the butt into his face, using the momentum to come to my feet. I know this shouldn't be happening, but the fact that it is sends a thrill through my body. He goes down, and I flip the gun, press it into his ribs, and fire. The recoil pitches me onto my back, and the body disintegrates. By the time I sit upright, Abel is headed for the exit. Wait, I call, but he slams the door behind me, making good his escape. It's probably for the best. Abel's obviously still more like the old me than what I'm becoming. I don't know what's causing it, but the effects are obvious. Perhaps humans aren't meant to be remade again and again, aren't meant to be gods. The truth is, it can't continue like this. Living quietly in the past is one thing, but this will change the future, my future, where my relatives and friends still live, irreparably. I hunker over my own remains, pat pockets slick with blood, until my fingers close on cool hardness and I pull out a smooth ceramic smart gun. Standing, I peel off my bloodied coveralls, wipe at spatters on my face and hands and push the gun into my belt, untucking my shirt front to conceal it. Number six has to be stopped. And number four if he's half as bad again as me. Once I've killed them and any others out there, I may have to pay Abel a visit. And perhaps even number one. And when it's all over, when there's no one left, I'll have to think about my own final disposition. If I live to travel back as number four, there's always the chance I'll change my mind, try to put things back the way they were. I don't think I can let that happen. Our final story for this Christmas special is Come to Daddy, written and read by Brendan Duffy, with additional voicing by Matthew Trulu. Please note, Come to Daddy contains frequent, strong language. Okay, JJ, up and at him, buddy. High school today. Oh, bugger off. It's Christmas. I'm not going. I rolled over. The pillow stank at the cleaners. I heard Father Barry laugh and take a long, slow suck on his cigarette. You've got a legal requirement to attend, sunshine. Yeah? And what'll they do if I don't go? Put me in a boy's home? You learn important stuff at high school, mate, to get ahead in life, an advantage. Oh, fuck high school. I learn nothing. Well, you've got an access visit today. It's your dad. Oh, yeah, right. He's missed the last five. Why would I want to see him? Fuck him. I pulled the blankets over my head. But it was too late now. I was awake. And fuck you too, Bez. You're a fat cunt. Oh, am I? He tickled me. Am I, hey? He tickled more. I tried to ignore him and pretended I was annoyed, but I couldn't help myself and started laughing. He was all right. The only person I'd ever let touch me ever again. And he knew it too. 
I gave in and I sat up. Do you think you'll really come? Well, that's what he said. So come on, get dressed and have some breakfast. Father Barry went round the dorm, opening blinds and windows, calling, Come on, kids, hands off cocks and on socks. Light streamed into the room, through the shattered reinforced glass that sagged in the frame, between bars that weren't just there to keep the bad people out. Anyway, it was Thursday. Everyone was going to be down at Shopping City. Joyride, too. The last time I saw her, she said she'd be my girlfriend, and everyone thought she was hot. I unlocked my wardrobe and examined my collection of badges. Holdens, Fords, Daihatsus, Toyotas, 18 all up, and today I'd add another. I pulled on my urban camo fat rags, mudslinger vogue, white salt ring on brown speckle. The sweater was standard doll wear issue. The slogan read, Urban Renewal Gang 37. I stuck strips of heavy duty duct tape down the sides of each leg, street style, and inflated my steel rim sneakers. I donned my cap and hood, and checked the mirror. Totally eight mile. The downstairs lounge was like a drug bust. Mismatched furniture was piled against the doors and windows. The stuffing pulled out of the couches and burnt, and fire extinguisher powder everywhere. The place stank. The new kid had sprayed his own tag across the walls. There was a punch-on in the kitchen. Kids yelled, munched, and threw stuff. Spaces had been cleared on the table for breakfast, where chipped crockery waited. I checked the institution names printed on the spare bowls. There were three Turana boys' homes, two St Vincent's hospitals, a Q cottages and a Pentridge prison. I smashed the Turana boys' homes the ones against the wall. That place sucked, and then I pulled up a chair at Pentridge. Father Barry rushed in and he looked about. Any shit from you lot and I'll flip the switch. Everyone just ignored him and kept yelling, and he frowned and then left. Someone started up the chant. Baza, Baza. Real deep and slow, and everyone joined in, singing it, laughing and swaying in time. As usual, we eventually changed over to Softy, Softy, and then someone started on Poofta, and we were tripping over how funny it was. OK, OK, come on, we're leaving in five minutes. Father Barry came in and dropped a pile of urine sample containers on the table. Piss test before we go. He sorted through the labels calling out names and tossing catches, making a game out of it. Why the fuck do we have to do this? complained the new kid. So we know when you've been phone freaking and don't say fuck, said Father Barry. Well, I can't fucking piss. It's cause you're not keeping your liquids up. Drink some tang. Father Barry shoved the tin of palo orange tang in front of him. No, nah, I'm getting plenty of tang. Poon tang. He smiled and scanned us for reactions. The only fucking poontang you ever had is what your daddy gave you, I said, and everyone pissed themselves now. He started to go real red-faced psycho, screaming, No, no, fucking no. Everyone shut up, yelled Father Barry, but it was too late. The new kid hurled his bowl of corny flakes at me and stuck his fist in the nearest laughing face. Screaming biffo erupted across the table. It was fantastic. I jumped into the fray and started punching. And it was off just as quick. Father Barry flipped the idiot switch and we all froze. Statue time. It was kind of funny. My fist was stuck right in the new kid's face and his expression was hilarious. His cheeks all wrinkled and screwed up. My muscles were frozen solid, but I could still breathe, just, but real slow. Father Barry flipped the switch back and I felt my muscles slowly soften. The new kid blinked and smirked. Others laughed, embarrassed. Father Barry slammed piss containers in front of us. He stared at me. Now have your fucking breakfast. I sat back down. Relax, Max, I am. I waved a fag at him and lit up. Don't fuck with me, buddy. Father Barry shoved a tin of tang and a packet of corny flakes in front of me. A lady in a g-string bikini stared from the pack seductively. As usual, everyone left to do their piss samples in the toilet cubicles, and the new kid would get his tipped over his head. I poured some water into the piss container, and got out a little sachet of Dexiwiz crystals, and then tapped some in. They fizzed, and I gently swirled it round and round, until the liquid turned yellow. I sniffed it. Yuck. Just like real piss. The label on the sachet said, Dexiwiz powdered urine. Perfect yellow urine every time. Pass any piss test with flying colours. Reorder 1-800-PISS-TEST-ACE. There was still half the sachet left, 
so I tipped it into the tin of tang, then nuked my sample to body temp in the microwave. I stuck it on the table and went to brush my teeth. Father Barry was rushing about, trying to round everyone up. OK, now whoever stole the van keys, it doesn't matter, because I had a spare set cut. Oh, and somehow the van had a flat tyre this morning, so I got a guy to come over and fix it. Now the bill for that and the keys is coming out of your pocket money, so everyone in the van, we're all still going to high school. I ducked into my room and grabbed my school bag, then unlocked my secret stash and tooled up. I packed heat like a fucking peacekeeper. I was ready for high school. Father Barry herded us down the hallway, through the sonic scanner, to the garage. As usual, the newbies made their dumb blunders. The new kid red-lighted three knives and a small metal pipe, probably some kind of zip gun. His mate had a mobile phone, a soldering iron, and a whole stack of DIY computer chips. Everyone grumbled and carried on as the new kid kept red-lighting. Father Barry would discover an item, confiscate it, walk him through the scanner again, then discover the next item, and so on, and so on. It took fucking ages. I just wanted to make my break and catch up with Joyride. I had stuff to do, and was feeling itchy. I cruised the Sonic Moronic fine, green lights straight on through. My ordnance would never turn up on that clapped out piece of junk. Father Barry, he aimed a plastic tea gun at my head, pulled the trigger, sprayed me with mics. A computer voice said, Ward of the State, IMMTH 11022038181. Your T-chip GPS is activated. I watched a red blip appear on a monitor by the door. That was me. The others, too. We were all now located on a map of the suburb. On the board. Tagged. When we were all safe in the van, Father Barry deadlocked the doors. Only then did he tell the garage to open. Light flooded in. It was a cloudless day. Big blue sky. Baking sun. Perfect for flying. Father Barry backed out through the banked up mud onto the road. It was like a war zone out there. The flood had broke the levee again, and Celine mud was all up the streets. A thick brown coating covered poles, cars, houses, strangled trees along the embankment, everything up to about a metre, all gloopy and stinking like sewerage. I heard the van's super knobbies crack through the dry crust of salty mud, then slip and spin in the slop underneath. With this sun, the mud had started to get that crazed look, just like how I felt right now. I looked out the window up at the skylines tracing through the blue. Oncoming lanes flowed side by side like veins and arteries on some TV medical bloopers show. The outer urban three cloverleaf interchange was thick with flyers like blood cells. Branching turnpikes led to and from the surface. Why can't we get a flyer like the Melbourne City Mission units? Then we won't get bogged, I said. Yeah, a flyer for our resi unit? In your dreams, said Father Barry. The only flyers we'll ever get to see are those ones going overhead, so get used to it. Whatever. I'd already fucking totaled more flyers than he'd ever been in, but I wasn't going to tell the poor sod that. So we drove off to high school, through the crowded roadworks, mudslinger crews and ground traffic, and finally we made it to the back end of a mud jam. Father Barry reached into his pocket, pulled out a ringing mobile. Hello, Barry speaking. Yeah, yes, I see. One moment, please. He looked at me. It's your dad. He locked the mobile and then handed it over. Dad? Hi. Hey, sonny boy. Dad, it's great you're coming. I got you something real good. You'll love it. Did you bring the Incredible Hulk action figure like I asked? Uh, no, nah, not this time. But you said you'd get me whatever I wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, mate. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to make it today. Again? But it's Christmas. You promised. Uh, look, I'll, I'll see you soon, though. Yeah, when? Well, tomorrow I'm taking some leave, and we're all going on a holiday to Queensland to cruise around the Whitsundays. Oh, wow, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. And I was thinking, what? What were you thinking? I felt the beach air in my face already. Well, I was thinking that I'd, I'd give you my Christmas present when I get back, and I'll see you in a, in a month or so. Static crackled down the line. What do you mean? I'm not going. Nah, mate, I couldn't swing it with the courts, you know. No unaccompanied visits, all that crap about being a bad dad. You don't believe that stuff, do you? Uh, no, nah, no, nah, but who's going on the holiday? Well, me, Francine, and your sister Cindy. I felt my face flush. She's not my sister. Look, I'll get you something when I come back, anything you like. Yeah, sure, like all those other times you said that. You said we'd get to swap presents today, remember? 
I really wanted that Incredible Hulk action figure, remember? Sorry, Sonny boy, no can do. Next time. I'll see you in a month. I bet you got Cindy something good for Christmas. Look, Sonny boy, don't get shitty with me. This is just the way it is, so you'd better learn to shut your bloody mouth, okay? Yeah, well, you promised, and we're still going to meet today. I want my Incredible Hulk, and I've got something special to give you. Well, I don't care. He hung up, and the phone went dead. I stared at the screen, memorising the number, fuming. Come on, JJ, no funny stuff. Give the phone back. Father Barry grabbed it out of my hand. He stared at me. Are you okay? Just let me out of here. I got my overboots. I'll walk the rest of the way to school. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll unlock the van door when we're inside the high school garage for secure handover, buddy. High school. High security remedial school at where I do a mandatory day program to avoid going to yet another boy's home because for my own safety, the court ruled that I can't go back to my real home. It's a detox and rehab behaviour intervention program for phone freaks and I'm in year six, and they tell me high school is where I'll learn new skills and new apprenticeships that will get me ahead in life to help me go places. I'd spent the whole of last week with a shovel on mudslinger duty, clearing streets with work gangs of homeless and jobless, training for when I grow up and into the real world, so I won't become a rent boy. Such advantages. Yeah, I'm going to go far. Fucking far away from here. It's time to go. We were near the corner of North Five Aqueduct and Muddy Canal. A payphone was a few minutes from here, near a bus stop. I peeled the sticky latex gas mask from inside my coat lining and smoothed it onto my face, squeezing out the bubbles. The new kid stared as I pulled the poison pen from my pencil case, flipped the lid, and the whole cab filled with choking white smoke, mothballs and battery acid. Everyone was coughing, crying and hacking. Father Barry hit the lock and we all piled out. I hit the ground at a run and was so out of there. Squinting, I dodged through lines of traffic aggro, horns blaring rage into the dusty day. I ran along the treeless bank of North Five Aqua, around piles of rubbish and dirt. At Muddy Canal, the crust broke through and I sank thigh high into the slop, but just kept wading to higher ground. It was hard going in the heat and when I ripped off the mask to get some more air, the rotting stench made me gag. I ran as fast as I could, but some old bag lady was there, chewing into the payphone. I had to buy some offline from a tea chip real fast, or the whole day would be totally screwed. There was no time to spare, so I menaced her with my knife, and she backed off, sucking on her teeth. As I fed dollars into the phone, she pulled a bread knife, and we had ourselves a little standoff. So I did a few tricks. I waved and spun my plastic replica in her face and she bought it and stayed back, but I kept one eye on the old slapper as I dialed up double O, double five, what's new, and said my codes and passwords and got today's GPS tracker hacker number. They changed it all the time. I dialed up and typed in more codes and passwords. A computer voice said, Ward of the State, IMMTH1102203832, your T-chip GPS tracking signal has been deactivated for and I fed a stream of $10 coins into the slot. One hour and two hours and three hours, four, five, six hours and 40 minutes. Do not tell the police. Thank you for subscribing to this service. Please use this service again and have a nice day. Ha! I gagged the tag and the day was mine. I ditched my plastic overboots just outside the mall. There was a Santa's little helper display for the kids and the place was crowded with the Christmas crush. But I got through the door scan no problem, so Squiddy's new chip fudge must have been working just fine. Either that, or the mall security was totally baked, because I know the air con sure was. No one else would be here yet, so I had a bit of time to piss around with some small time shit. There were 12 banks of telephones in the malls. I knew them all off by heart and was feeling real toey and needed to scratch some itch, so I went straight to the closest one. I inserted a credit card. Phone Freak was my favourite, so I dialed up. It was disconnected. I dialed Fuzz Phone, Freaky Phone, Phone Tone, and a few others. There was nothing. It was all deadline. There must be some new kind of crackdown or something. I got out my notebook and trawled through some of my old numbers and finally got one. Double O Double Five Phony Fun. Ha, <laughs> my old faithful. I held the phone near the base of my neck, behind my right ear, just where the T-chip is located, and pressed it in real hard. The sonics were good. I heard them vibrate through the bone, but the chip didn't pick up much. I got out Squiddy's amplitude modulator he'd borrowed to me. I jammed it into the earpiece and then got back into it. I heard the frequencies, the beeps and whines, got a taste and closed my eyes. 
I felt that stone wash spread out through my body and relaxed with a sigh. Kick back and ride the wave. My hands and feet tingled. The warm purple welled up and the skin on my face flushed all hot and dirty. It was a bit rough, but it fed the freak real good. Yeah, it'd do for now. People stared and they shook their heads, but I kept moving. I worked each bank of phones with two-minute calls. The video guards would be watching, and if I stared vacantly or dribbled in front of passers-by, they might send a mall patrol to hassle me or alert the telecom watchdog to deadline all the phones. I met Flipper at the third phone bank. I knew him from Turana. You seen Joyride? I asked. Yeah, she's going to be here real soon, he said. I just nicked the latest Trip D CD. We shared speakers. It was hot. Trip D was so cool. I wanna get high, I wanna get real high, I'll get yourself a teacher, but just don't let them track ya, cause this one ain't for freezing, this one's gonna whack ya, buy yourself some offline, dial up the phone line, freak your brain the main line, ride the way through dream time. Flipper was young, but pretty cool, not try hard, just straight up. I got him to keep guard while I freaked some more, and he was all jealous cause he didn't have a T-chip yet. All he ever wanted was a T-chip so he could freak just like the rest of us. I've been warned, Flipper said, sniffing from a bag of glue. Threatened. The juvie judge said I was becoming the type of youth that needed careful monitoring. One more court appearance and he's going to sentence me to the operating table. Looks like I'm finally up for a tea chip. Oh, nice one, I said. Yeah, but what's a guy got to do? Well, today's looking hot for some Grand Theft Auto. Stick with me and you'll be going under the knife real soon. Oh, cool. So I maxed out three of my cards while I phone freaked. In the middle of surfing the highway, the lady bitchfuck femputer voice cut in with a dead cred buzzkill. Thank you for your custom, Mr Turner, but your credit has been declined due to insufficient funds. Please, and I'd be dumped out, back into the shopping mall. Thank you for your custom, Mrs Smith, but... Thank you for your custom, Mr Abrams, but... It was a pretty dirty high, and it left me with a bit of a headache. Halfway through the fourth card, some weird shit happened. I got bounced around the local telephone exchange... There were crossed lines, and I heard a few phone conversations, tele-shopping, telemarketing. Then I saw a rapid visual montage. A man standing at a payphone turned to look across Burke Street Canal. Then a woman quickly glanced about inside a dim office where lots of people at computers wore headsets. Then I got some full sensories, dial-in experientials, real expensive stuff, abseiling, plummeting through the air, and an exhilarating head rush. Then a quick cut to a velvety bed with a huge boobed naked blonde straddled above me panting yes 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 i was a seven foot black man with a massive cock i gagged and everything went hazy a translucent purple squid exploded into my trip its tentacles writhed through the crazy haze and flashing light bristling with chrome and plastic implants penetrating my mind its suckers locked onto my head Cyborg modification is the only way to freak it, boomed through my brain. Telecommute the fattest bandwidth. The purple cloud cleared and I came down and landed in the mall, next to the hideous purple squid. It reached an arm up and ripped its own head off like a mask, leaving a human face. I collapsed to the ground, dazed, staring at my hands. They were small, white, and I wasn't seven foot anymore. I felt real queasy. JJ, why are you fucking with that roughshod kid's shit? I looked up at my mate Squiddy, standing before me, chubby, in his school uniform, greasy black hair pasted down onto his scalp. Check it out! I made the latest model. He wobbled the purple latex squid in my face. Little flashing lights traced through the translucent latex to the various modules set into it. Its creepy eyes blinked and tracked me as he waved it about. Squiddy pointed out the features. It's got a double Moby, rejigged frequency modulator, umpty school processor, Amplitude regulator, soft jacks, mem stash, and a remote control. It's a smooth ride. His eyes were crispy glazed. I don't even have a tea chip yet, whined Flipper. He examined the squid in awe. But when you get one, you'll get the latest model, Squiddy enthused. They're a direct route into the brain, hardwired. Every time the CP dub improves the tea chips, we crack them and improve the squids. Their upgrades let us send better signals straight into the stoner centre. There's special fat bandwidth numbers now. Paisley Park, everyone's there. All you need is squid. I got up off the floor, blinking and rubbing my eyes, trying to clear my head of that last image. It was awful. I fucking hate sex stuff. Like how that time in my bedroom... Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck! I gagged, dry-retched. I saw my dad. He broke through the crowd and walked past, smiling, with a smart shirt, corporate hair, holding girly shopping bags, probably from a bitch stepsister. 
I snatched at his shirt tails. Don't touch me, I yelled. He spun around, scared. It wasn't him. I unclenched my fist, and he backed away. I'll fucking get you, I called, and I almost spewed again. I grabbed Squiddy. I never want a dirty rush like that again. I want one of these new squids you've got. Calm down. Don't demag your tag. I'll rig you a squid, but we'll need some things. We'll need a couple of mobiles, a radio-controlled racing car, any kind of electronic keyboard, a magnetic credit card reader, and a couple of other things. Do you know where we can get all this stuff? Yeah, I knew exactly where. We ran through the sweaty crowds, laughing and swearing. Mums and dads jostled on the edge of nasty while snot-nosed brats stamped feet tantrums at the ready. It's the festive season, a time for family. Threats, violence, bribery and Christmas presents. Thongs thwacked in time to strategic advertainment music as this rogues gallery of tracksuit and t-shirt zombies bumped shoulders to stare at things they couldn't afford. But my dad bought me presents all the time. A whole life packed into a jumbo cigarette carton, wrapped and tied with a shiny bow. There you go, sonny boy. Merry fucking Christmas. We spat in books, spat on food, spat on brats, pinched heaps of stuff, pushed things over and hid from the mall guards. They were useless anyway. Legally, they're not allowed to even touch us. All they ever do is just ring the cops and the child protection workers, the fucking CP dub. Then they follow us around videoing what we do while we make faces, laugh and flash them. We all pigged out on Daglo Slurpees, Super Double Trouble Bubbles, bags of Chocololics and chocolate mudslides with all the cash from the wallets I'd just found. <laughs> In the centre square, a sign said, It's a family Christmas. And there was the display for the Santa's Little Helper franchise with a stable and hay and elves and deer and lots of spray on snow. Cues of whining toddlers were bustled forward by tired parents on the verge of belting someone just to get a photo taken with Santa. Santa sat on a chair, bouncing a terrified kitty on his knee, while everyone laughed, even her mum. I reached over the fence, and I lifted a whole Santa bag full of goodies. "'Hey, put that back!' said an elf in a green velvet cap and pointy boots. "'Fuck off, Poofter," I said. Squiddy and Flipper came over, and the elf backed off, so we started checking out the loot. Santa saw. He rounded up a whole posse of elves and made his way over. "'Ho, ho, ho, kids, come on. There's plenty for everyone!' Not any more, there's not. I held the bag away for him. Come on, put the bag back. Oh, fuck you. Santa's eyes widened. The elves closed in. Look, kid, just pay your 50 bucks and line up like everyone else and it'll all be okay. Well, I don't have 50 bucks. Ho, 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 I'll tell you what then. Why don't you just all choose your favourite thing from the bag and you can have it. No way. I'm fucking keeping all of it so I can make a squid. Now, what would your parents say about that? asked Santa. Ha! My fucking dad told me you were real, I said, and he also said he wouldn't hurt me any more. Then he put me in fucking hospital. So fuck you. You're not Santa. You're just another serial job flunky on work placement for long-term doll bludgers so you can avoid the mudslinger duties in the work gangs. I've seen you at the Mudburbs Reclamation Project. I snatched a card from his back pocket. It's your job placement card. Mo Davis, 50 bucks an hour. Ha! You're riding the downward spiral, Mo. I can smell the whiskey on your fucking breath. Give me that, said Santa, snatching at the card. His eyes tracked behind me, and he smiled. I knew it was the mall guards. Santa started to get tough now. I'll fucking do you, you little shit. Yeah, well, if you want to do me, Mo, it's 500 bucks, just like with those kids I saw you with in the toilets. See, you're just a fucking dumb fat nonce like the rest of them, Mo. Gee, when I grow up, I want to be Santa, bouncing kitties on my knee. Is that what attracted you to the job? Going to find out who's naughty and nice? Sanders' face was bright red. People gathered, mums and dads, elves and kids. The mall guards pushed through the crowds and closed in about us. They milled around, looking professional, videoing and talking into their radios, getting serious looks on their faces, trying to stare me down. What are you staring at? I asked the nearest. I've just called the cops, he said, and you're in big trouble. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right, I'm real fucking worried about the cops, and as if this crappy mall could afford a call-out when you don't even have aircon. The guard got a call back on his radio. The cops refused to come out. I just laughed, and Santa got all shitty. He lunged for me, but I pulled out my mini-soaker, and I sprayed his face with a high-pressure burst of lemon chilli. He went down screaming. Squiddy whipped out his cattle prod, and he zapped an elf. I pulled the pin on a few stinko grenades, and I threw them about the mall. The whole place reeked of burnt chilli, and people ran everywhere, coughing and spluttering. The mall guards decided they'd had enough, and were escorting shoppers away from the clouds of tear gas. 
That was when we started smashing shit up, yelling and screaming at mums and kids as they ran. I snatched some radio-controlled car off some little shit and held it out of his reach, laughing. He cried, kept on trying to jump up for it. I'll smash you in the head, I said. I'll smash... And then I froze solid. I'd been iced, mid-gesture, bug-eyed staring. Shit, it's the CP dub, yelled Squiddy. Run. They ran. They left me standing there like a statue. The brat snatched his car back and slapped him a face, over and over, and it really started to fucking hurt. But I was frozen, and there was nothing I could do. The little shit didn't stop until his mum finally dragged him off of me. Three CP dubs sauntered down the walkway. The lead one guffed forward, spinning his red plastic tea gun like a cowboy. When he got to me, he did a little dance, hands up and pig-rooting in the air. Notch up another one to domain. He imitated shooting my head off with his tea gun, then blew imaginary smoke from the plastic barrel. Two more, and you cunts owe me five hundred bucks apiece. They all slouched around, talking about who owed what to who, and who was an ace and who was a cunt, as though I wasn't even there. I just stared into the distance, frozen. Domain raised his hands for silence, then lowered the mouthpiece of his headset over his moustache. The Department of Human Services, please. Dialing now, said a computer voice through his helmet loudspeaker. Good morning and welcome to DHS Central Repository, said a switchboard operator. What service do you require? Yo, Central, this is child protection worker Domain Jones. I just iced me a juve. I need the Caring for Kids initiative to run a check. Roger, please hold for check. They stood around waiting, and then a different woman spoke. Hello, Caring for Kids, Child Protection Database. This is Carol speaking. Yo, Carol, it's Domain. I've got a stiffy for you. Yeah, sure, Domain, said Carol, with an audible eye roll. Please hold. They all waited while she tapped a keyboard. In the interim, Domain grabbed my arms and bent them so they were straight up in the air. Freeze, he mocked. They all laughed. Domain twisted my cap so that it was on backwards. Then he rearranged my fingers so they were signing a street tag. I call this one Trip D the Fat Rapper, yo. More laughter. My face got redder and redder, and I wanted to punch this asshole, but I couldn't move. Domain put my thumb in my mouth. This one is I Want My Mummy. From the corner of my eye, I occasionally saw Squiddy poking his head from behind a wall. I heard a crackle. Please scan the young person now, said Carol. Domain adjusted the dial on the side of his T-gun, then aimed at my head and pulled the trigger. Well, Domain, according to the T-chip, your stiffy is... Mm, Mike Hunt of Collins Place. That's no resi unit. That's a pretty swish address for a juve. If you've somehow iced a citizen, that's going to be your ticket. Are you sure you've got the right guy? Mike Hunt? What's the DOB on this sucker? Well, the T-chip says this guy is 18 years old. No way, said Domain. There's fudge on this chip. Domain got out a well-thumbed notebook. Now, what model T-chip has he got installed? 3.2.0. OK, Domain flipped pages. That model's after some Sydney hacker blew a hole in the 3.1.4 freeze duration timer. Can you check on the data there? It's on 11 minutes, 45 seconds remaining, said Carol. His cardiopulmonary and motor functions are at half a rest. Muscle fibrillation is 100% frozen solid, and his current life status is OK. He's hacked the personal data file, though, Carol. Can you please do a search for security breaches there? Yes, personal information has been virally modified, she said. Domain flipped pages in his notebook. OK, let's run the 3.2.1 Data Integrity Protection Patch. We'll just upgrade over the top to restore his original personal info. I'm sorry, Domain, the 3.2.1 patch hasn't been rolled out yet. What? Why not? There's still no state policy to skirt the federal government's privacy package, and the UN Human Rights Advocacy Board has disallowed such manipulation of personal information. Domain huffed, then flipped through more pages. It was a good thing I couldn't move, because if I could, I would have laughed. It was going exactly as Squiddy said it would. He reckoned the T-chip version 3.2.0 had an unhackable freeze duration timer, but he found a backdoor into the muscle fibrillation control and inserted a worm that reset 100% to 0% when triggered by a debug. Then he'd stacked my T-chip with lots of really obvious mods. I knew what Domain would say next. OK then, run a debug. It should strip off all the mods and virals. Roger that, said Carol. We heard more keystrokes. Debug complete. The young person is 11 years old, 
from the Salvation Army Resi Unit at Carolyn Springs Work for the Doll Ghetto. He has 25 outstanding warrants, multiple grand theft auto, multiple arson, theft, phone freak, evade police. Yeah, the CP dub, all cheered. Request pickup, domain beamed. Pickup acknowledged, ETA nine minutes. Well done, domain. This one's worth 4,000. Take the rest of the day off. They all danced around, slapping each other high fives. Hey, how's that, little buddy? <laughs> Domain leered into my field of view. He did his pig-rooting dance in my face. There was kebab caught in his moustache, and his breath stank of sour yogurt. I felt my muscles slowly relaxing. It was all I could do not to laugh, but I played along, pretending I was still frozen. Domain arranged me into a few more poses. I call this one, Who Farted? <laughs> I raised my middle finger up, but he just made it into another pose. Freeze, it's a stick-up, he chortled. I gave him the finger again. He frowned and balled my fingers back into a fist, then stood back. I let my finger slowly pop up again. Hey, he keeps flipping me the bird. The others broke into laughter, and Domain stared into my eyes, frowning. He waved his hand in my face. I stayed frozen, only my finger between our faces. Domain scowled. I winked at him, then kneed him in the nuts real hard. He went down like the sack of shit he was, and I whipped out my minicam flash module and blinded the other two with some dazzling halogen starbursts. I snatched Domain's mace and dosed them all till it ran out, then kicked their T-guns away. Mike Hunt, I laughed as Domain rolled on the ground. I got out my paint and I sprayed my tag onto him, marking territory I had conquered. JJ, a double fish hook, on his forehead. Don't you ever touch me again, I said. I grabbed a cricket bat from the gift basket and approached the Santa's little helper display. I knocked Rudolph's head clean off with one hit, then smashed holes through the walls, tearing down the decorations. The others ran up and joined in. We ripped into the gift basket, toys and more toys, mobile phones, radio-controlled stuff. We were cheering and laughing and smashing and throwing wrapped gifts to each other. It was great. We fucking smashed and smashed and smashed. And then I got a mini tov from my jacket and I lobbed it at the Christmas display. It exploded and the place caught fire. I love fire. I threw more mini tovs and flames spread quickly. Fuck Christmas. I was laughing. I was laughing so hard I hardly knew what I was doing. Fuck your Christmas. Fuck Christmas totally. Retox and dehab. Joyride strode through the clouds and smoke, wearing a spray-on gloss black vinyl skin suit and bike helmet. Flames reflected off the shiny surface. I'd raced her once, and she'd beaten me. She beat everyone. She stood with her hands on her hips, white face framed in black. She was beautiful. What's your real name? I asked. Fuck me, she said. Speechless, I stared. She smirked. Fuck me, she repeated, taunting. Fuck me. I collected my wits and wondered what Trip D would do. Don't you want to fuck me? She raised one of her eyebrows and a sly smile spread across hot pink lips. She was quoting Trip D lyrics. So I knew what to do. I played along. I'll show you how it's done, I said. Well, if you want to fuck me, you'll have to catch me. She winked, then turned and ran. Blonde hair spilled from under the glossy black helmet. Fuck me, fuck me, don't you wanna fuck me? Hold you down and smack you around, I'll show you how it's done. The CP dub was stirring, pouring each other with rags in their little containers of eyewash. We didn't have long before they'd be after us. I looked for the others. Come on, let's go. Rooftop car park. It's race time. I ran. But first, I grabbed this real cool Incredible Hulk action figure I'd seen. The very one I wanted. It had arms that could punch and move any way you wanted, and it actually swelled up when it got angry. Squiddy and I chased Joyride through the mall and then out onto the crowded rooftop car park. It was a perfect day, hot and still, with clear blue sky. A perfect day for flying. We searched between rows of crazy-coloured flyers until a squealing sound filled our ears, tyres screeching on concrete. People hurried away from the white clouds of rubber smoke. We glimpsed the back end of a flyer doing a long, slow donut, laying the rubber down. It vanished back into the billowing cloud. Joyride emerged. The flyer bike had the intakes gaping open, sucking air, jets screaming. She sped across the car park to a rooftop gravaport and dialed up a direct hyperlane launch. Lights on the signal box ran through the launch sequence, red, amber, 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 green, and she was gone, a dot racing away through the blue. Squiddy and I ran for a bank of parked flyers. He dialed his favourite carjack number and sprayed the place with IR unlocks. All the older Fords activated. Horns sounded fanfares, lights flashed, and central locking popped open and rolled out the red carpet. No, nah, no, nah, no, nah, I said. Squiddy dialed again and popped all the Holdens. I looked about. There were all kinds of flyers parked here. A shoe, two conch shells, a crab, a couple of insects, antique car lookalikes. There was a hat and a submarine. There were boats, even a couple of gondolas. 
But then I saw the one I wanted, the hottest. A juiced up four-seater Volkswagen Skyrider. It looked like a fat Christmas beetle, metallic green panels and gold trim. I dropped to my knees and stared. Squiddy, the Skyrider. I've never had one of them before. Okay, he downloaded more sprays and painted the place. All four doors popped open, tongue hanging out like it wanted us. I dived into the cockpit. Pink and red plush gel bed interior, all soft and gooey like the insides of a real beetle. The wooden dash, chrome and gold dials and lots of encrusted plas windows bulging like bug eyes. It was so cool. I hotwired the dash and began an all-engine warm-up sequence for an ultra-high-speed takeoff. Rear left and right cowlings opened like a carapace and metamesh jet foils unfolded revealing two chubby turbines. The whining heat blast from their exhaust rebounded from the wall shield and made the Skyrider shudder. We slid around as Pitch and Yaw were suddenly transferred to me, but I was still strapping on the Autotrack VR goggles. Something was way wrong with the interface and I could hardly see over the dash, and the Skyrider bumped into each parked flyer as we drifted down the row, denting plastic panels, setting off alarms, sonic blasts and auto pepper sprays. Finally I got control, but finished off the row of cars anyway, saying, Oops, gosh, darn! A scraggy-looking Santa burst through the doors, yelling his head off, charging straight towards us. He was lugging a huge smoking bag of toys and running as fast as he could. It was Flipper, looking over his back, chased by the CP Dub. Flip ran, and the CP Dub made formation, spraying micros, trying all their freezers for all the T-chip versions. Nothing worked. Flipper kept coming, but so did Domain. He broke formation and charged. I hit the elevation control, zoomed over car tops and levelled side on. Flipper dived into the rear and slid across the ultra-shine faux vinyl bench seat. The bag burst and toys scattered everywhere through the cabin. Ho, 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 let's fucking go. His beard hung sideways from his ear. I snap-locked the doors and the cowlings, raised the seat up high so as I could see over the dash, then pumped big air. Jets soared as the Skyrider surged up three metres, but Domain took a screamer off the shoe flyer nearby, leapt into the air and grabbed the driver's mirror. He hung there, swinging back and forth, trying to grab at something with his other hand. He looked into one of the little bug-eye windows, frothing at the mouth about his 4K. I opened the window near his head. Take the rest of the day off, Domain. He swung his tea gun up into the window, but I grabbed it out of his hand. I laughed and shook my head, but he still hung there, ranting. He stuck his arm right in the window and grappled for the door handle, so I gave him a Chinese burn, hard as I could. The others wrestled his arm down, so I pulsed us to the Gravaport grab field and dialed up a direct hyperlane launch. The turbos squealed in anticipation. All clear for launch in ten seconds, said the auto attend. Domain cocked his head forward and looked at the red lights on the signal board and then back at me. I leaned close to the window so as he would hear. Nought to two hundred in two seconds, Domain. I call this one... One small step for mankind, but one giant leap for an unkind small man. Hit it! I punched the console and Tripty blared out the four-way subwoofer system like a sonic fucking boom. Fuck the CP dub, they the rub. Sell you to the man, spend it down the pub. Domain glared at me with his watery eyes. JJ sprayed onto his red and forehead, mouth working overtime. I slowly raised my index finger like before, and we all watched the launch sequence. Red, amber... Amber, amber, green. He let go at the last moment, and we pulled some massive fucking G as the Skyrider Top 200 straight through the oncoming slow lanes into the outer Urban 3 shopping city turnpike. We screamed and screamed, squashed back into our seats. It felt like a carny ride. The prox alarm blared five different kinds of shit, and I think we clipped a semi as I dodged us up through flashes of oncoming God knows what the fuck. I finally pulled us into the southbound hyperlane and paced the other traffic. I waited till I calmed some. Mmm, better put seatbelts on. Flip had turned bright red to match the Santa suit. Squiddy just flashed me a raised eyebrow, and then he scanned the dash dials. It looks like Joyride's heading for Clover, and the CP dub just launched. Two, no, three kitty wagons holding Mac 2 divvy vans. Okay, let's see what this baby can do. I opened up the throttle. Turbines wide and dials maxed, needles peaking comfy in the red, just where I like them. We hit the outer Urban 3 Cloverleaf interchange real fast. The curves were tight, and we almost wiped out a few times, bouncing off the gravnet lane wall like a stone skipping across the water. But I kept my eye on Joyride and tagged her all the way. We banked round and round the loops, weaving through traffic, changing lanes and wiping out the bot dots. I got to run other flies off the road if I made them veer at an angle steep enough to actually break through the gravnet and out into free space. The clover leaf was best, and we always played tag there. You could stay in the clover forever, just going round and round the different loops, levels and turnpikes, and if you ever got stuck in an outbound, you could do an illegal lane jump, hit the gravnet wall real hard to punch through, 
dodge some oncoming and head back on in. Squiddy opened his toolkit and went through all the toys and phones, breaking them apart and rejigging the innards to make a squid. He had a few spare latex moulds. I chose one that looked like a conch shell and he stacked it with all the goods just right. It fit real snug and I felt the humming behind my ear. I heard the sea. Squiddy networked us and dialed up. The dial tone connected in my head and then everything turned a purple tinge as the warm stoner rush blew my brains. Bot dots flashing, gravnet warnings, head pulsing, green light red. Round and round and round we went, chasing Joyride, chased by three shiny white Mac 2 Divi vans. What a perfect day. I'd let the CP dub get level with us, then do a quick lane change on them, and they'd be out of the loop, heading way out to the Melton Exchange, frowning back over their shoulders at us. And they'd have to fly all the way out to the nearest U-turn marker, because they couldn't break the law and breach the gravnet wall. Domain floored it hard and caught up to us, mouthing, pull over, pull over, and pointing to the side. We were all so stoned and laughing, we waved and said, OK, OK, and then I suddenly veered into him, and he shat himself and braked. I dodged between chrome snapshots of Joyride smile, Domain's yapping face, and everyone else. Bored, angry grey suits with bored, angry grey lives. Briefcase bourbons and bashings. Flashes of spoilt shits. Daddy's new little girl. Pink ribbons and curls. He's hitting me. She started it. Shut up or it's a clip round the ear for you, mate. A forgotten life. Pressed up against the plas and sped away to gone. Fuck all that. I jumped to my favourite Trip D track and relaxed into some high-speed traffic weaving. I wanna get higher than high. Steal me a flyer and fly. Name red large across the sky. Crash it, smash it, set it on fire and fry. I caught up with Joyride. A few hand signals and we ditched Domain and his cronies out on the Digger's Rest flyover. We fled down Hyperlane South, through the outer Urban 3, towards Old City, Commerce 1, dodging slowmobiles 500 metres above the treeless sprawl of medium-density apartments lining the mudslick tidal floodways. Everything was brown, strangled dead by toxic mud, rotting and falling apart. We raced over the mud burbs, a low-rent wasteland laced with viaducts and causeways. Seen from up high in the sky, they formed a pretty pattern, like a skeleton, or like they were brown flowers strung out on concrete stems branching out from Old City. The mud burbs had never looked pretty before. I must have been so wasted. I was careful to stick to the lanes and avoid free space. Way out here there can be lots of trouble if you cut across high ground. They pay big rates and have lots of radar cops. The lanes always go over the mud burbs, but to either side was green and trees, housing estates, parkland and walking the dog. Only high ground was green. High ground, the sprinkler burbs. Lazy huddles of villas and haciendas clustered about new technology parks, all surrounded by vast treed expanses of rolled-out GM lawn felt, halogen-fed and too dark green. The open spaces were a calculated security measure so that any wall-jumping intruders would be detected and intercepted before reaching valuable taxpayers. Walls, razor wire and watchtowers, wide promenades patrolled by armoured cars, protected, self-contained shopping malls, entertainment complexes, tasteful apartments with courtyard gardens and VTOL launch pads. Safe. Safe like you never had to leave. Yeah, never had to leave. I remembered it all, and it wasn't safe. I don't care about nothing, so don't bother asking why. The whole enchilada is the funk we can stay high. So dial up gringo and toast me some El Dopa. Cause refried brains is your only memory stopper. <laughs> We chased Joyride over Old City, a busy sector of condemned buildings where the flooded streets were crowded with houseboats and flocks of gondolas, lush rooftop gardens with bustling flyer parks. It was the most crowded forbidden area in Melbourne, mainly illegals and refugees. Joyride took the turnpike down into the floodlands where buildings rose straight out of the water. South Melbourne, South Bank and Docklands. Seems like Joyride was up for a bit of tag among the sunken buildings. I knew how to make it a little more interesting, so I punched through the gravnet into free space and took us way up high into the dreamy blue for all to see. I typed my special message into the Skyrider autopilot, then activated the smoke machine. It wrote, in perfect 10,000 point courier across the cloudless Melbourne sky. What are you writing? asked Flipper. I was just really stoned. 
Oh, I was stoned out of my fucking mind. What is it you're writing? Squiddy up the amplitude until we drooled, and we were laughing so out of control. Domain Jones is a cunt. We were pissing ourselves blind. I left the smoke machine on and sent us into a high-G corkscrew dive, like a paper trail for him. Round and round and round we spun, pressed up dizzy against the walls as we spiralled down among the shitty old buildings. Colours exploded through my head as I pulled us out with metres to spare and sped along the flooded street canals so low we kicked up a splash wave in our wake. We raced through the canals of Old City, dodging buildings, bridges and gondolas. We got close but never quite caught Joyride because her bike was just too quick and she handled it really well. We'd lose her and glide between the dank, rotting buildings, scanning for her bike, catching glimpses of sunken cars and bridges with algae streamers floating in the deep. Then she'd bolt from an alley, and the chase was on again. It wasn't long before a divvy van levelled in next to us, Domain, in his Mac 2. He waved and pointed. I looked. Two more had pulled in, behind and to the other side, hemming us in. Domain did a dash-spam dial-through, and the Skyrider controls went dead, but Squiddy got them back online. Domain then tried to hack the Skyrider with a dash-lock dialer virus, but I floored it up King Street Canal at top speed. Squiddy up the freak to Max Amp, and I didn't fucking care about anything anymore. All I remember is laughing heaps about nothing as my whole body melted off, then going real spacey quiet as a Paisley Park fuck through bloomed in my brain and some derelict skyscraper somewhere half raced towards us, and it was real funny. I kind of knew someone somewhere should do something sometime, but I was laughing too hard to care. Flipper was yelling and screaming. I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't see. Squiddy laughed so hard he cried. He just pointed at the building as it came closer. He cranked up the Squidify and I think I blacked out. At the last moment, Squiddy dumped the wave and I could think again. I veered hard, but it was too late. At 200k, we smashed through a window of the old Global Climate Regulator building. Junk floated about inside the cabin as we bounced off ceiling, floor, ceiling, floor, punched through an internal wall and then burst into a vast flooded space crowded with people a market. We splashed down near some gondolas in a floating cafe, charcoal and chilli, lots of swearing people, and then I crashed us through another window and back out into an alley. The Skyrider was pretty fucked up and it didn't sound real good. The roof was near ripped off and most of the windows shattered. Some flyers are all crumple zone. The CP dub were nowhere to be seen, so we'd gained a bit of time. Look, it's getting hot, I said. I think it's time we all split up. I floored it hard, straight up the side of the building and then over onto the rooftop. The car park was full of flyers. Squiddy and Flipper legged it. You guys split and I'll run the gauntlet on the cops as a decoy, called Flipper in his Santa suit. Remember, my big day in court, he tapped behind his right ear. Thanks, fellas. Squiddy sprayed the flyers with IR unlocks. Let's get out of here, he said as doors popped open. See you guys soon, I took air. Give me a call and we'll do it all again. We all split just as three Mac 2s rose up above the rooftop. I floored it and dived low into the canals, taking corners hard. Flipper hung above the skyline, alarms screaming and lights flashing, flapping the aerofoils before racing off with the attention of the CP dub. They must have gave chase, because I lost them real easy. I think the Skyrider had shat its guts real bad, so once I was away, I just lurked in the back lanes of Old City. I dialed up 0055 communicator locator, and I keyed in the number of my lost mobile, and there he was, on the screen, on the board, a red blip, up at high ground, Commerce One, the Paris end of Collins Street, where it's all barristers, bankers and bizzo suits. My dad. I hate suits. I cruised to the building he was in, and I headed for the rooftop car park. The auto bouncer hit me for security clearance to pass the building's grav wall. I flashed a replica of my dad's card for the scanner, and then I landed so hard that bits shattered and fell off. And there it was, his big black beamer, like a gigantic black sausage. I could just tell the tinted windows from gloss panel. I climbed out of the wrecked Skyrider, grabbed the badge for my collection, then approached the Beamer. A huge gift-wrapped box with a gold bow tie sat on the back seat. A pink card said, To Cindy. Step away from the vehicle, said the Beamer in a husky voice. You have five seconds to comply. I kicked it. The alarm went off. I knew the Beamer would ring my dad's mobile, so I waited. He came up to check on his precious flyer, wearing one of his Italian suits, glossy shoes and gold cufflinks. He looked at me and scowled. Hey, sunny boy, what a surprise. Yeah, don't call me sunny boy. I kicked the beamer again. Hey, don't fuck with my flyer. Go home. He came towards me, 
Home? Do you mean the resi unit? He frowned at me. How come you're not at high school? How come you're not? I asked. Look, I was just on my way to get you a Christmas present. Yeah, all right. I shook my head. But what did you get for Cindy for Christmas? It looks huge. You must have spent a fortune. Oh, don't start whinging. I hated Cindy. He always spoiled her, bought her big presents, a big holiday. I fucking hated that bitch. He used to care about me. He used to buy me things. But now he's moved on to her. And then it hit me like a brick. He's moved on. He's moved on to her. Softly, softly, sulking in cigarette burns. The force and the fear. And the muffled screams from the bedroom. You've fucking started on her, haven't you? I saw it in his eye. The cycle of abuse and guilt spending, just like it was with me. You lying little shit, he said. Now this is going to be for your own good. Don't you touch me, I said. But he rolled up his sleeves and came at me. He belted me onto the ground and before I knew it, he lifted me back up and was smacking my head from side to side. I was stunned and dizzy and I fucking folded again, just like always. Stop, stop, stop. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I hated myself for saying that crap. Leering, he leaned right in to say some angry shit, finger poking my chest for punctuation. I fumbled with the string around my neck, found my sonic stunner and let him have a shrill whistle blast right in his ear. He flinched and cursed, hands on ears, buying me the few moments I needed to rifle through my pockets. He straightened up, furious as I'd ever seen, red cheeks shaking. Now this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you, he said. Cock the hammer! Cock the hammer, it's time for action! Cock the hammer! Cock the hammer, it's time for action! I know. I pulled the cardboard scattergun from my jacket and fired. There was a tremendous bang. The blast of rock salt threw him into the air and onto his back. He lay on the concrete, tried to get up, but fell back, writhing in pain, whining to no one, suit peppered with holes, face and hands all speckled with red. I ripped the strips of duct tape from my pants, and I bound his hands and feet real tight. In no time flat, I'd trussed him up like a plucked chicken, ready for roasting. I got out a Minitov, and I emptied it all over him. He spluttered and groaned as accelerant stung his eyes and his cuts. The vapours were strong. You were always a bad kid, he spluttered. I could never trust you. Panting and exhausted, I held up a book of matches. One more word and you're fucking toast. He shut up. I wiped the blood from my mouth and I checked my teeth. Two were loose. Apologise, I said. He scowled at me, blinking from the fumes. Fucking apologise, I waved the matchbook. What for, he said. For what you've done and for what you still do. He just shook his head, so I bent a match down onto the scratch paper and flicked. The match flared. I lowered the tiny yellow flame closer and closer to his doused Italian jacket. All right, all right, all right, I'm fucking sorry. Does it make you feel any better? You're pathetic. I took the Incredible Hulk doll from my school bag and I waved it at him. I got this for myself. I got out the little Christmas present that I'd bought for him and I threw it at his head. Merry Christmas. I needed fire. I lobbed my last Minitov right into the naked Skyrider cabin. The panels blew off with a huge explosion and an orange fireball curled up into the air. The wreck burned with crackling flames and a totally cool plume of thick black smoke. A Holden Mac II circled the plume and then touched down on the rooftop. Domain strode from the cockpit. He checked my bruises and then approached my dad. Sir, I recorded that incident. You assaulted the young person. I'm taking you into my custody until the police arrive to arrest you. But I'm his dad. Oh, great, said Domain. I get more money for domestic violence-related arrests. Domain dialed through to DHS on his helmet. Yo, Carol, we've got another total and torch. A modified Volkswagen Skyrider, that 4K juve, and one arrest. The father. He just assaulted the juve, and I caught it on video. Request pickup. Acknowledge, Domain. Pick up ETA 12 minutes. Domain came in close to me, staring at my bruises. You see, boy? The CP dub look after you. He got out his first aid kit and began dabbing at my mouth with an antiseptic cloth. Whew, that one's going to swell real good. Don't touch me, I said. Hold still. Look, I'm legally obliged to administer first aid or I don't get paid. It stung and I backed away, but Domain kept pace with me, dabbing at me. See, kid, you think we're the bad guys, but we're really... Domain's other arm jerked back behind him. He turned and looked. I'd handcuffed him to the rail with his own cuffs. I stepped back out of his reach and tossed the handcuff keys over the side of the building. Just in it for the cash, I finished for him. Domain rolled his eyes and kicked the wall. 
You fucking little shit. I'm going to get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get in line, mate, said my dad. I couldn't believe these assholes. It was time to have some fun. I checked my pockets. Not much stuff left. I pulled out a fat texter. Don't you graffiti my Mac too, said Domain. Oh, I won't. This is full of chlorine and brake fluid. My last one. A real cracker. I looked at the two clean flyers parked nearby. Dad's glossy black beamer and Domain's shiny white Mac 2. I flicked the cap off the texter, depressed the felt tip to break the seal, and then shook it up. We all heard the contents mix and fizz. You've got about 30 seconds. I'm going to torch one of these flyers. But which one? The beamer, the beamer, said Domain. No, 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 sonny boy, I'm your dad. Don't listen to that idiot. Get the Mac 2, and I might take you to the Wit Sundays. No, 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 torch the beamer, and I'll make things easy for you. I could lose today's file, or I could show you more hacks for your tea chip, said Domain. I walked up to their flyers as they ranted and yelled, begging me, snarling at each other. I approached the beamer. Domain laughed, but my dad piped up. Promise me you won't torch the beamer, and I'll take you to the Wit Sundays with us tomorrow morning. Promise. I thought about it. The Wit Sundays. It'll be just like old times, he said. OK, I promise. I turned from the beamer and ripped the badge off the Mac 2, and I pocketed it. Domain's face fell. Oh, no, he pleaded. No, no, no. I can get your whole file wiped. If you torch my flyer, I'll come after you, boy. You mean like today, I asked. Then I levered the fuel cap on his shiny white Holden Mac 2 divvy van, and I slid the texter down the pipe. My dad laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, he knows what's good for him. He just knows who hits harder, said Domain. I pulled another texter from my jacket, flipped the texter cap, pressed the tip, and shook it up. It fizzed and warmed in my hand. You promised, said my dad. I lied. I ripped the badge off his beamer, popped the petrol tank, and slam dunked the texter down the hole. I walked to the edge of the car park and dialed Joyride's mobile. The Mac 2 exploded. It wasn't much, more like it just caught fire. I'd seen better. Still, Domain cursed me and stamped the ground, then adjusted his headgear. Um, Central, we've got another flambe. Um, this time it's a government issue vehicle. Domain glared at me. Yes, yes, it's a Holden Mac 2 divisional van. Yes, mine. Yes, yes, I know. He ripped his helmet off and threw it across the car park while it was still talking. Joyride landed a flyer bike on the rooftop and came over. The day had turned out quite nicely after all. I saw the smoke and flames and recognised your handiwork. She indicated the blistering Skyrider and Mac 2 wrecks. Nice job. The beamer exploded and we all jumped. The fireball was huge and I felt the heat sear on my cheeks. I cheered. It was great. My dad's expression dropped as he watched it burn. Shit, Joyride laughed. You have been busy. The heat's going to be here real soon. Let's go, I said. Joyride stood before her chrome and plastic flyer bike. She was beautiful. The flames flickered in her vinyl curves. What's your real name, I asked. Penny, she said. What's yours? Timothy. We stood on the rooftop. I held my hand out to her. She reached out and took it. We ran to her flyer bike and hit the sky in nothing flat. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of their publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2009. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. <laughs>